Christmas traditions, why we do what we do at Christmas, the history behind our Christmas traditions by Katrina J. Wilson. Introduction. Have you ever wondered why we do what we do during Christmas? In this book, you will discover the history behind our major Christmas traditions. The reason I got into this study is that over the years, as pastors, my husband and I had numerous Christians share with us that Christmas had become so commercialized they decided not to celebrate. Others had heard teaching that Christmas traditions were of pagan origin and felt the church should not carry on these pagan traditions. At one church, it got to the point that some members of the church were upset if we put up a Christmas tree or a wreath, whether in the church or in our home. Some did not put up decorations or give gifts. Then there were those who felt the Bible does not indicate to have a special celebration of Christ's birth. I saw that sincere Christians were confused, and it was affecting their families too, especially the children. Here's the point, though. I didn't know why we did what we did at Christmas either, so I didn't have an answer. That's when and why I began this study. What I discovered was fascinating to me and hopefully to you also. As I have taught on this subject at our church and various other churches, people have asked me to put this information in a book, as they had never heard this type of teaching about our Christmas traditions. So that's what I'm doing. In this book, I do not get into every story behind every tradition, but give a brief history of the ones considered most reputable. First, I will begin with the Christmas story from the biblical perspective and share some interesting history you may not have known. Secondly, we will look at those traditions of Christmas that we have held dear to see if they should still be practiced today. My desire is that as you get a greater understanding of the history behind the Christmas story and our traditions, you will be able to celebrate Christ's birth with confidence and purpose. Chapter 1. Taking another look at the Christmas story. Is Christmas a story to celebrate? Is it truth? There are those who say the Christmas story is almost like a fairy tale. Angels, a young pregnant teenager engaged to a poor carpenter, a baby born in a barn, from shepherds to wise men to a wicked king. Yet, 2,000 years later, lives are still being changed through this amazing story of God's love. Today's statistics tell us that there are more than 2.4 billion Christians worldwide who will celebrate Christ's birth. That's miraculous in itself. Even though the Christmas story is true, does the Bible indicate we are to continue to celebrate Christ's birth today? There are those who believe the Bible does not indicate a specific way to commemorate Christ's birth, so there should be no special time of celebration. As I've listened to various debates, I've asked myself, does God really want us to celebrate the birth of his son? Then I thought that in our society today, when a couple has a baby, they may send cards in the mail or announce the birth of their newborn on social media. Now look at how the Bible reveals the great lengths Father God went to in order to get the news out about the birth of his son. There wasn't social media at that time. So what did God do? God sent his angels from heaven to earth to make the announcement. He even placed a brilliant, shining celestial star in the heavens above to proclaim the birth of his son. That star was so bright that it caught the attention of wise men in the east who traveled a great distance following that star to celebrate the birth of God's Son. Realizing this helped me to see the extent to which God went to let people know and to celebrate the birth of His Son, Jesus. And if God wanted people to acknowledge Christ's birth, then don't you think He would want us to honor and celebrate Christ's birth today? For it is the story of God's love for all mankind. This is a story to tell, his story. I want you to think about the following statement. If we as Christians do not acknowledge and celebrate Christ's birth, who will? But you may think, yes, we can acknowledge his birth, but it's how we celebrate with the traditions today that is the problem. Is it? 
we will look at those traditions and get in depth with that a little later. But let me begin with taking another look at the Christmas story. I want to share some interesting biblical history and insights you may not have seen before about the greatest story ever told. As you read this Christmas story again, look for these underlying revelations. How important is the Christmas story? The Christmas story is so important that God himself was the first to foretell of the coming of his son. In Genesis 3, we read of the fall of Adam and Eve, which brought about disorder upon all future generations and separation from God. God then revealed his plan of restoration when he foretold the woman's seed, which was Jesus, shall bruise the head of the serpent, which is Satan. We then see how God demonstrated his plan of love when he sent his only son Jesus to the world as that babe in a manger. Jesus came through what is known as incarnation, meaning the union of divinity and humanity. As the Apostle John states, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus came to dwell among us in order to restore us. The Apostle Paul shares about the timing and purpose of Christ's birth in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons and daughters. Christ came to redeem us back to God. 700 years before Christ's birth, God spoke through his prophets. Isaiah foretold that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Micah prophesied of his birthplace, Bethlehem. Two gospel writers share the Christmas story. Luke, as a physician, tells of Jesus' humanity, the Christ, the Anointed One, the man among men most wonderful. Luke was a Gentile, the companion of the Apostle Paul, the author of the book of Acts, not one of the twelve, and he never saw Jesus in the flesh. Yet Luke says he had perfect understanding of what happened at the birth of Christ. How could he have known this? We see that Luke shares Mary's story in intimate detail. This gives the indication Mary told her story to Luke, and most theologians agree with that. Luke begins with Mary's lineage that reveals to us that Mary was a descendant of King David through his son Nathan. This meant Mary had both legal and natural rights to the throne, which rights she passed on to her son Jesus. In the book of Luke, we also read of the appearing of the angel Gabriel to Zacharias, then to Mary, and of the host of angels to the lowly shepherds. This is recorded in Luke, the first and second chapters. And then there's Matthew, a Jew and former tax collector for Rome, who was called one day by Jesus to a higher service as he was seated in his place of business. Matthew writes to the Jews that Jesus is Jehovah's King of the Jews and Savior of the world. He shares from Joseph's viewpoint and lineage as Joseph was from the tribe of Judah, the kingly line of King David through his son Solomon. He writes of the appearance of an angel to Joseph in a dream, assuring him that the baby that Mary is carrying is of the Holy Spirit and is to be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Matthew is careful to note that Joseph is not the father of Jesus, but seven times he states that Jesus was virgin born. Matthew also shares about the wise men who traveled from the east following his star. It's recorded in Matthew, the first and second chapter. Here are some interesting insights into the Christmas story. As we look at the various people connected to Christ's birth, there are those of all ages and social standing, people from all walks of life. This reveals God is no respecter of persons. Even heaven and earth are a part of his story. Angels are involved throughout. There are three angelic visions and five supernatural dreams that surround the birth of Christ. Look for them. The angel Gabriel, one of God's special angelic envoys and chief messenger, is seen in the beginning of the story. His name means man of God. Notice that he is the same angel that visited Daniel in the Old Testament. 
Gabriel is known for his faith-filled statement to Mary, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Zacharias, an elderly priest who was in prayer in the temple, is the first to be visited by the angel Gabriel. The angel proclaims to Zacharias that his prayer has been heard and he and his wife Elizabeth will have a son in their old age. Their son, John the Baptist, becomes the forerunner of Jesus. How did Luke know such details about Zacharias and Elizabeth? Scripture reveals Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, and we read that Mary goes to stay with Elizabeth for three months. No doubt during this time, Elizabeth told Mary about all the things that happened to her and Zacharias, and then Mary shared these stories with Luke. Mary, a young maiden from Nazareth, was also visited by the angel Gabriel. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, he shared with her that she was highly favored. She had found favor with God. We see Mary's genuine love for God and her sincere faith as she replies to Gabriel, Be it unto me according to your word. It is believed that Mary was a teenager. Why? It was the Jewish custom of that day that girls were to be betrothed as young as age 12. The mate was selected by their parents, and marriage could be consummated as early as age 13 to 15. Isn't it amazing that God chose a teenager to be the mother of his son? And then there's Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, who was a carpenter by trade. He was a just man, an observer of the law, yet he was merciful. What may not be realized is that in those days, carpenters were not skilled cabinet makers, but those who fashioned crude doors, rough beams for houses, and simple wooden tools. Mary's family must have been of humble circumstances to allow her to marry a carpenter, as he was not a man of means. This is indicated by his simple offering at the temple of pigeons or doves. It's interesting that at that time, being engaged was as binding as a marriage contract today. After Joseph discovered Mary was with child, he considered divorcing her privately until he received an angelic visitation through a dream, letting him know the baby that Mary was carrying was of the Holy Spirit. Joseph awakes and by faith takes Mary as his wife. I thought, why did an angel appear to Joseph in a dream? Yet, angels appeared in visions to Zacharias, Mary, and the shepherds. Could it be that his dream and his obedience to that dream was preparation for him to be led by three more dreams that brought not only direction, but protection for him, Mary, and baby Jesus? Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem when Mary and Joseph were from Nazareth? Caesar Augustus became the emperor of Rome at the young age of 18. He has an interesting history. He was known as a man of high morals, married over 52 years, and he also conceived and brought forth mass political reconstruction that kept the Roman Empire together for more than 200 years. And it was this same Caesar who sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. Little did he know that behind his decree was the divine will of God that brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem from Nazareth, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Bethlehem means house of bread, and the prophet Micah foretold of this city as Christ's birthplace. Even though Bethlehem is only three miles south of Jerusalem, it must be realized that Mary and Joseph traveled from their hometown of Nazareth, which is 90 miles to Bethlehem. This would have been a grueling trip, especially for an expectant mother who was nine months pregnant, whether she was riding on a donkey or walking. The inn was not usually well attended and considered sort of a shabby place. Normally, travelers stayed with members of their own family, and no doubt Joseph had planned to stay with his family or friends, but he was unable. Because of the crowd of the city, there was no room even in this dilapidated inn, and they ended up in a stable behind the inn. The stable was a place for outcasts, the ignored and the forgotten. But where else would the Lamb of God be born? 
Due to the pressing emergency of the impending birth, Evidently, Joseph was offered this elevated platform over the inn, usually a cave. The animals were probably in the field, so the place may have been reasonably clean and empty, but who knows? The birth. It's interesting that some theologians believe Joseph may not have been present when Jesus was born. He may have been searching for a midwife. Scripture says she brought forth her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes were bandage-like cloths used to wrap a newborn. Often Jewish babies were sprinkled with salt at birth as an antiseptic measure, then their arms pressed down to their sides, and the infants wound about with clean bandage-like swaddling cloths. It was believed this would strengthen the babies. The manger was a hollowed-out stone used to hold food for animals. It is basically a feeding trough, and this became the makeshift crib for baby Jesus. The shepherds in those days practically lived with their sheep and were exposed to all kinds of weather. Another interesting aspect about shepherds is that they were held in contempt by Orthodox Jews, because their occupation was considered ceremonially unclean. They smelled like their sheep, as they would seldom leave their sheep unattended because of predators. Shepherds were lonely, had many hardships, and missing the better things of life. But lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and a multitude of the heavenly host. Why would God send not only one angel, but his heavenly host to lowly shepherds? Through his angels, God not only directed these shepherds as to where to go, but this heavenly appearance established the need for them to go immediately and to know their sheep would be safe. God wanted these shepherds to worship the Lamb of God. Also, we must realize that the stable was only temporary housing. Mary and Joseph would no doubt leave the stable the following day. After that heavenly visitation, these shepherds made haste to find this newborn baby that very night. Afterwards, they not only praised God, they told everyone they saw about Jesus. It's fascinating to know that God chose these lowly, lonely, socially outcast shepherds who would normally be intimidated to become the first evangelist to tell the story of Christ's miraculous birth. Here's another interesting insight. Why did the angel tell the shepherds the sign to them was to be a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger? Theologians believe these were no ordinary shepherds, but rather priest shepherds who kept watch over sheep that were to be sacrificed. Bethlehem was the specific place for keeping these particular sheep. Why would these shepherds understand the meaning of the sign? When a sacrificial lamb was born, the shepherd would wrap the lamb to be sacrificed in swaddling cloths to prevent the lamb from harming itself and to calm the lamb down. Then the lamb was placed in a ceremonially clean limestone manger to be inspected for being without spot or blemish. These sacrificial lambs represented the Jewish Messiah to come. When the angel told the shepherds of the sign, they knew this was the sign of the birth of their Savior, Christ the Lord, the sacrificial Lamb of God. The wise men from the east, perhaps Persia or India, came to worship the king. They were not specifically referred to as kings, but the scientists and astrologers of their day, studiers of the stars and sincere seekers of the truth. Tradition says there were three kings because of the three gifts, but historians say there were many more magi than three in that caravan. The wise men first journeyed to Jerusalem, the capital city, naturally expecting the new king to be in his palace. They proclaim, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. How did they know it was his star? It is believed that Daniel first introduced the Magi to the Holy Scriptures of the God of Israel. In the book of Daniel, we read that the king of that time made Daniel the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. 
It is thought that then throughout the centuries, these wise men studied the Hebrew scriptures. Therefore, they would have understood the timing of the Messiah's birth and the sign that would lead them to the place where he would be born. And the star was no ordinary star. History records its behavior was totally unorthodox, shining brilliantly even in broad daylight and at times disappearing. It was the Magi's faith, not just the star that led them. Others had seen this same star, but not the message. King Herod is another person who was a part of the Christmas story. This king was known as one of the most wicked kings of history, and no man was so bitterly hated or cruel as him. Rome only allowed him to continue to rule because of his efficiency as he rebuilt the walls and the temple of Jerusalem. This was the Herod who expressed his lying desire to the wise men to come and worship the newborn king. When the wise men did not return, this jealous king not only put out a decree to slaughter infant boys up to age two to be sure no one would take his place, but history also records as he lay dying of a loathsome disease, he gathered 45 of his chief men of his nation and murdered them in mass. This was King Herod. Yet God still used this evil king for his purpose. How? It was King Herod who called for the Jewish chief priests and scribes who shared the prophetic word of Micah, the prophet of the Messiah's birthplace. It was that word that directed the wise men to Bethlehem. And the wise men did not stop until they found their king. As the wise men left the palace, notice that the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. Note that scripture refers to a young child, not a baby. Theologians believe Jesus could have been up to two years old, and the wise men could have been traveling that long since they had first seen the star at Christ's birth. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. It's interesting that Joseph and Mary were still in Bethlehem, living in a house, not in their hometown of Nazareth. So regardless of when the wise men arrived, they are part of the Christmas story. And being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they journeyed home and history record they heralded the news of Christ's birth. The Magi gave interesting gifts. Gold is a medal of kings, signifying their recognition of Christ's kingship. The Magi gave pure gold from pure hearts. Frankincense, an oil was used in offerings of worship and prayer. It's made from gum or resin taken from trees and burned before the altars of the Lord, and its fragrance ascends heavenward as a sweet-smelling savor, as priests would offer prayers for his, the people. This was a symbol of their devotion, worship, and loyalty to Jesus. Myrrh was an ingredient of the anointing oil used to anoint the tabernacle furnishings and to anoint Aaron and his sons to set them in office as priests as part of their consecration for service. Jesus is anointed as priest and king. Myrrh was also used as part of the anointing of the body of the dead, so this gift was truly prophetic. The Magi did not exchange gifts among themselves, but these gifts were for Jesus. These were the best of gifts. Their gifts were both practical and prophetic. Practical as the gold helped the Holy Family journey to Egypt. Prophetic as these wise men realized the spiritual significance of this newborn king. The Christmas Story, God's Plan of Love. As we read the Christmas story, we see not all the events that happened surrounding the birth of Christ were good, but God protected his son. Through five dreams and three visions, God gave direction, and men and women listened and obeyed. Luke shared that the child Jesus grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Though all was not joyous when Christ was born, yet the angel still said to the shepherds, I've come to bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. What good tidings? God so loved the world, you and me, 
He gave his only son that the world through him might be saved. And I believe during this season, if we will allow it, we can draw on God's love as we refocus on the story of God's plan of love called Christmas. Chapter 2. To tradition or not to tradition? That is the question. Christmas in America. There is Christmas music, some stations playing music 24-7. People rushing yet smiling, shopping, church choir singing, homes aglow with lights, guests welcome, food, candles, carols, kindness and love shown, and gifts exchanged. Streets are decorated, stores filled with merchandise, with mega advertising for bargains. Yes, the world goes overboard with the pressure of their promotion, and yes, Christmas advertising begins even before Thanksgiving. But don't be too upset about that. This tradition started during World War II. People wanted to send Christmas packages to troops overseas. Because advertising for Christmas did not begin until after Thanksgiving, gifts were not arriving before Christmas Day. People and the troops complained. Therefore, the government asked merchants to begin their Christmas promotion before Thanksgiving so troops could receive their packages in time for Christmas. And the tradition continued. I'm aware there are various opinions as to how to celebrate Christmas. Some love and enjoy the season and have unique family traditions. They can't wait to put up their decorations and lights and start saying Merry Christmas even before Thanksgiving. I'm one of those. Even though my family was not Christian when I was a young child, I still have wonderful memories of our times at Christmas. Others have had no special traditions, and Christmas means little to them, so they think, what's the big deal? I know there can be difficulty emotionally as this season approaches due to stress, loneliness, or painful memories associated with Christmas because of some people's own unfortunate past personal experiences. My family and I understand that as we suffered a tragedy during Christmas a number of years ago. But in time, we have also experienced his healing presence during Christmas. Christmas is to be joyful, yet it can be stressful. Even violence and wars will continue in the midst of this special celebration. Then there are government officials and lawyers who continue to argue about the separation of church and state and want all mention of Christmas banned. Of course, they still want people to shop to keep the economy going. Just don't ask why. And this rhetoric is also affecting the Christian community. Recently, a pastor was interviewed on television and commented, There are too many religions now in America and celebrating Christmas could be offensive. Therefore, it is time to quit. In fact, Christians should eliminate all Christian holidays. Eliminate not just Christmas, but all Christian holidays? Can you see a downhill slide? It seems the politically correct have gone politically mad, and there are some in America going right along with this. It is apparent government and schools or on such politically correct eggshells that they want Americans to either no longer acknowledge Christmas or at least stop saying Merry Christmas but Happy Holidays. It's become winter break, not Christmas break, and on and on it goes. Let's face it, we live in a broken world, but perhaps we should look at Christmas this way. Christmas is the reason why Jesus came to bring healing to hurting humanity. Personally, I believe that during this time, if we will refocus on God's plan of love called Christmas, it can be a healing time. I mentioned we had a tragedy during Christmas and Christmas became a difficult time, but I believe it has been our focus on God's love during the Christmas season that has brought healing. Could it be God wants us to celebrate the birth of his son because it is one of the ways we as Christians can receive his love and also let our light shine and help bring healing to others as we share the true meaning of Christmas? Again, I say, if we as Christians do not acknowledge and celebrate Christ's birth, who will? What is the big deal anyway about saying Merry Christmas during Christmas? 
Why are some people and many in government so, seemingly so offended when they hear someone say Merry Christmas? It seems it's gotten to the point that there are those who want to eliminate the word Christmas altogether. Could the offense be coming from the meaning of the word Christmas? Christmas is actually made up of two words, Christ and Mass. Christ means the anointed one, and Mass means celebration. Therefore, when you greet someone with Merry Christmas, in reality you are saying, have a merry and joyous celebration of the coming of Christ, the anointed one. Could it be those who are offended by hearing someone say Merry Christmas may not even know why? Recently, a middle school music teacher was in the news when she changed the words of the song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, to I'm Dreaming of a White Winter. But not all is negative. There is the opposite that has happened also. A few years ago in England, the government distributed a video to all elementary schools in London entitled, It's a Boy, about the birth of Jesus. The purpose was to teach the true meaning of Christmas. The founding director heard about a five-year-old boy who saw the Christmas story and asked afterwards why Mary named her baby after a swear word. This was his inspiration to make the video. You see two things here. This shows how far away the world has come from knowing the true story of Christmas, but also reveals there are those who are pushing forward to share the real message of Christmas. Is Christmas a story we should continue to celebrate? Is Jesus really the reason for the season? Even some Christians have become confused about celebrating Christmas. Not only have I had some Christians say that Christmas has become too commercialized or too politically incorrect, I've had other Christians tell me the Bible doesn't indicate we are to celebrate Christ's birth. Is that true? Because there is not specific biblical instructions of a how to celebrate, does that mean there is to be no acknowledgement, no traditions, or no witness to others of Christ's birth? As I've read the Bible, this is what I've seen. I've seen that God has wanted his people to be a celebrating people. Look at the feasts of the Old Testament and their symbolisms. God instructed the Jewish people to celebrate 10 weeks a year. 10 weeks a year. Even in the early church, they got together almost daily and celebrated. Think about this, and I mentioned this before. God so wanted his people to celebrate the birth of his son, he sent a host of angels to shepherds to announce Christ's birth, and they couldn't wait to tell the story. He also placed a star to shine so brightly to wise men that they traveled a vast distance following the star bringing gifts. What a birthday party that must have been. And history tells us they returned to their country to share the story. It must be realized that Satan is an imitator. He never originated anything. He only perverts truth. Satan's ultimate goal is to put out the true light of Christmas, the story of Jesus Christ. He tried that when Jesus came as a babe. He wasn't successful then, and he will not be now. Perhaps there is a deeper point here, and that's mainly what this book is about. And that is this. To tradition or not to tradition? That is the question. I got in this study because I did not have an answer for people who ask me about the traditions of Christmas. Could our traditions assist us in sharing the good news of Christmas? Or are Christmas traditions of pagan origin and we should just stop? Here is a comment written by a well-known pastor that gave me a good perspective about celebrating Christmas. For those of you who may be struggling about what to do at Christmas, I believe his words may be an encouragement to you. Jack Hayford, a pastor in California, stated, How do Christians make Christmas joyous, special, and without it becoming either paganized or too commercialized? Our challenge is to find and show the way to be a holy, happy celebration of the season. Sadly, I've encountered victims of sanctified Scroogeism, or the silly, superficial, senseless type of holiday celebration. But at the same time, 
Most people display an incredible vulnerability from Thanksgiving through the new year. I have seen many receive Jesus in the midst of our own congregation's celebration of God's love and Christmas fun during this season. A congregation or family that embraces Christmas rather than embarking on a crusade against it will do more than avoiding traumatizing their kids by trampling on traditions. Chapter 3. The History of Our Christmas Traditions why we do what we do at Christmas. I just mentioned, to tradition or not to tradition, that is the question. I believe many people just do not know the background of our traditions. I didn't know. As I studied, it surprised me to learn that almost all of our traditions came about as a result of revival spreading across the world. You will notice that most, if not all, of the pagan traditions no longer exist. I mentioned Satan is an imitator. Could this enemy have been trying to pervert what was long held sacred and God through his people turn the meaning of those traditions around? So let's look at the history of those traditions and evaluate why we do what we do at Christmas. Time began with Jesus. Our calendar is based on Christ. Over the centuries, there have been many calendar systems. 46 years before Christ was born, Julius Caesar established the Julian calendar based on 365 and a half days with no reference to religion. After Jesus' birth, the Roman Empire began to feel the power of the gospel. Constantine began his reign as a pagan emperor, but in 315 AD, he had a vision of a shining cross in the sky inscribed, by this sign you shall conquer, and he did. Soon he decreed a new calendar in recognition of the Christian faith. Based on a seven-day week with the first day of the week as Christian Sunday, a day of rest, prayer, and worship commemorating the resurrection of Christ. 150 years later, a great scholar and student of Scripture proposed that the entire course of history be reckoned from the birth of Christ. Everything before his birth would be B.C., meaning before Christ, and every occurrence after his birth as A.D., Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. By the 13th century, this calendar came into common usage. The Russian communists tried to experiment with calendars of their own, and they struggled until 1940 when they returned to the Christian calendar. Even though some Jews use their own dating system, mostly for religious use, they still use the Christian calendar, noting BCE, meaning before Christian era. Even they must recognize that nearly 2,000 years ago, something happened in Bethlehem which changed history. Why December 25th? The date of December 25th actually came about as a result of Christianity spreading across the world. Most theologians agree Christ was not born on this specific date. They believe it was warm in Bethlehem as the shepherds were in the field. However, recently, a theologian, Dr. Taylor Marshall, has stated that the date December 25th could come from the early church's belief that Jesus was conceived during Passover on the date March 25th, and if you go back three months from conception, the date would be December 25th. Personally, I do not believe knowing the exact date is of the greatest importance. It is the remembrance of the purpose of not only Christ's birth, but his crucifixion, resurrection, and his return. History tells us it took over 300 years for the church to decide on a day on which to honor Christ's birth. For many years, Christmas became anything but a holy day, and because of this, the church even banned any type of Christian celebration of Christmas for a time. In the year 125, the second bishop of Rome declared church services be held to memorialize the nativity of our Lord and Savior. Usually, these services were held on January 6 and referred to as Epiphany, the revelation of the Christ to the wise men. December 25th was the ancient Roman festival Yule, honoring the sun god Friar. Yule ceremonies included decorating the home with evergreen and burning special logs. Now, those who feel 
Christmas traditions are of pagan origin may cry out, See, I told you. Well, there is more to the story. Christian historians tell us when the great revival in Europe took place during the fourth century, there were so many new converts that the Christian church decided to change the purpose of this pagan festival in order to help these new converts and also to protect them. Therefore, in 345 AD, the Christian church changed its own holiday celebration of Epiphany on January 6 to the December 25th date. And notice that both of these dates honored Christ. Now, instead of worshiping the sun god, S-U-N god, these new converts worshiped the son of God. This became a witness to others and helped to spread the good news of Jesus. It blesses and encourages me to know that the tradition of celebrating the birth of Christ on December 25th came about as a result of revival. Epiphany Celebrations Today the celebration of Epiphany, which is from Christmas Day to January 6, continues especially in Latin American countries. A few years ago, my husband and I visited Puerto Rico right after Christmas. Our friends there took us to a wonderful, inspiring Epiphany parade with beautiful floats. It was such an exciting celebration emphasizing Christ and the wise men. We were told that one of their traditions is for families with children to put a shoebox of hay, one for each child, under their beds. This hay is for the camels to eat, as the children believe the three kings will visit while they sleep and the camels may be hungry. Then the hay is replaced with gifts left under the bed by the kings. Actually, larger gifts are given on Epiphany and smaller gifts are given on December 25th because the people feel the celebration of Epiphany honors the kings who shared the gospel with the world. Epiphany is the final day of the holiday season and families take down decorations, sing carols, and spend time in prayer and praise and reflection. Advent is a part of the Christmas celebration. Advent was established by church leaders in the 6th century. Advent is a Latin word meaning the coming. It was originally meant as a time when Christians reflected on the meaning of Christmas and when new believers spiritually prepared themselves for baptism. Essentially, Advent is a setting aside of four weeks before Christmas to contemplate and prepare the Christian's heart not only for Christ's first coming, but also his second coming. In churches, a different candle was lit each of the four Sundays before Christmas, representing the Christians' great anticipation of the coming of Christ. Many churches still participate in Advent. Why a tree? How did we end up with a Christmas tree in our house? The Christmas tree actually originated in Germany. In the early 700s, an evangelist from Devonshire, England, named Boniface, established many churches throughout Germany and France. At that time, Germans worshipped the false god Thor, called the god of thunder, which was represented by a sacred oak tree known as the thunder oak. Children were even sacrificed beneath this oak tree to appease their god. Any unapproved people who touched this sacred tree would supposedly be struck by lightning. As Boniface prayed, he determined in his heart to destroy this sacred oak tree to not only save the life of human sacrifice, but to show the heathens he would not be struck down by lightning at the hands of their false god. On one of his many trips to Germany, it was Christmas Eve. Boniface came across a band of men who had gathered around this sacred oak tree, preparing to sacrifice a baby boy to their false god. Boniface was horrified and he demanded the men to stop their ritual, and he began to preach the gospel to them. When they mocked him and refused to hear him, the story is told that a holy boldness came upon him. Some say Boniface ran up to the tree and hit the tree with his fist and commanded it to dry up from the root as Jesus did the fig tree, and it uprooted. Others say he picked up an ax nearby, took one mighty swing at that great oak, and suddenly a great gust of wind arose, and the huge tree began to shudder and fell and then uprooted. What is known is this. 
The men were in awe when their sacred oak tree uprooted, and they viewed this as a miracle. Their God had no power against Boniface God. They immediately fell to their knees, and Boniface prayed with them, and they accepted Christ as their Savior. As Boniface finished praying, he contemplated as to what to do with these new converts. He then looked up and saw a small fir tree just behind where the oak had fallen. He felt this was a sign from God. He gathered the men around the fir tree and dedicated it to the Christ child as a substitute for the oak tree which these pagans had worshipped and to which they had sacrificed their own children. He explained to them that the fir tree was green year-round and it represented the tree of life, the life from Christ which these men had just received. These new converts then began to put up fir trees as a sign and witness of their newfound faith in Christ, and the tradition of a Christmas tree began to spread. Where did decorating a tree at Christmas originate? In December 1540, Martin Luther, the great German reformer of the just shall live by faith, added candles to his tree. He said it was to express that Christ, the light of the world, was welcome in his home, and it reminded him that life continued even through the winter. The tradition began to spread to other countries. Later in the 16th century, gilded apples, nuts, and colored streamers were added to the tree to represent the blessings and harvest of God. In the early 1800s, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, introduced the Christmas fir tree to England as a way to continue to celebrate the birth of Christ because Christmas celebrations had diminished and lost their purpose there. The tree is an important symbol. In Genesis, we see the tree of life, and Jesus died on a tree to restore us to God. Gifts beneath the tree represents God's gift to us of his son and the gifts Jesus has given us through his sacrifice on the tree, his gift to us, eternal life. Why candles and lights at Christmas? It wasn't until the 16th century that candles were added as part of the Christmas celebration. Not only were candles used in the churches, but four weeks preceding December 25th, Christians in every home in the villages would place four candles in a wreath in their window to celebrate the coming of Christ. The wreath represented the never-ending circle of God's love. As I mentioned earlier, this became known as Advent, which means the coming. This was a special way of celebrating the Christian's anticipation of the coming of Christ, both his first and his second coming. One candle would be lit each Sunday prior to Christmas Day, and on Christmas Eve, a candle was kept burning in one room of the house to symbolize the arrival of the new light, Jesus Christ. Lanterns were even put in barns as a reminder of where the Christ child was born. At midnight on Christmas Eve, the family would walk to the barn to pet their animals as a remembrance of the day the Holy Family had only animals for company. It is believed that midnight mass services on Christmas Eve were established as a result of this tradition. With the invention of the light bulb in 1879, Thomas Edison changed the way America illuminated their houses. Three years later, one of his employees decided to apply this new invention to his Christmas tree. And by 1910, General Electric introduced the string of lights to the public. The tradition of the National Christmas Tree Lighting on the White House lawn was started in 1923 by President Calvin Coolidge. Do candles, lights, and trees still have an importance at Christmas? During World War II, the story is told of a prisoner of war who was given one small candle and a match by his captors as it neared Christmas. Mockingly, they told him he could eat the candle or light it. He was starving, but he decided to light that tiny candle. That tiny candle burned all night long as this soldier thought of Christmas and worshipped Christ. His hunger left him. And by the way, he was home by Christmas to share his story. 
Could it be lights and trees are a part of the symbolism of the birth of Christ? When the wall came down in East Germany and the dictator fell in Romania, the first sign that Christianity was still alive was when people lighted their houses and put up their fir trees during Christmas. This was their way to let communism know it could not put out the light that was still shining in their hearts even after years of persecution. Isn't it interesting that one of the first things their government did to stamp out Christianity was to ban any celebration of Christmas? There was to be no mention of Christmas, no lights, no trees, no traditions. Does this seem familiar to what is happening in our nation right now? You see, when we as Christians put up our Christmas trees and lights, it can be a witness to others of our hope and faith that Jesus is the reason for the season. Are people today interested in putting up lights? Last year before Christmas, I realized I needed more lights. I went to several stores before I could find any. Each store was sold out, and it was way before Christmas. When I finally found some lights, I was telling one of the clerks about my difficulty in finding lights. She said to me, the CEOs didn't realize that people need a little light during this time, regardless of the economy. Isn't that true? Christmas carols and plays have a real impact at Christmas. Carol in Latin actually means to dance and celebrate. In the year 129, the first carol, Angel's Hymn, was sung at a Christmas service in Rome. But music was rarely associated with Christmas during the Dark Ages. In 1223, St. Francis of Assisi constructed the first nativity outside his church, and he invited children to come and sing carols he had written. Eventually, this resulted in nativity plays that spread in Europe. In the 1500s, Martin Luther embraced Christmas carols, but carols still were not prominent in the church. In 1741, George Frederick Handel, who composed the famous musical The Messiah, also wrote the music for Joy to the World. That began a stirring about having Christmas music. But ultimately, it was in 1818 when a village priest in Germany named Joseph Moore had his poem, Silent Night, Holy Night, put to music, and he sung it on Christmas Eve, that the tradition began of honoring Christ's birth through musical worship. This wonderful Christmas hymn spread throughout Europe and first appeared in America in 1871. Do not negate the effect of Christmas carols. During World War I and II, as well as during the wars in Korea and Vietnam, and even today, the singing of Christmas carols is one way that troop morale is bolstered during the holidays. Christmas carols sung in hospitals, nursing homes, and prisons encourage people who have little or no hope. Let me tell you about a unique Christmas carol that was used by the church to mysteriously convey biblical truths. From 1558 to 1829, Catholics in England were not permitted to practice their faith openly. Priests wrote this catechism song with hidden meanings to help children remember their lessons of faith. See if you know these faith lessons from the 12 days of Christmas. On the first day of Christmas, my true love, God himself, gave to me the baptized person, a partridge in a pear tree, Christ himself, two turtle doves, the Old and New Testaments, three French hens, faith, hope, and love of 1 Corinthians 13, four calling birds, the four gospels, five golden rings, the first five Old Testament books, six geese a-laying, the six days of creation, seven swans a-swimming, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit of Romans 12, eight maids a-milking, the eight beatitudes of Matthew 5, nine ladies dancing, the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit of Galatians 5, Ten lords a-leaping, the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20. Eleven pipers piping, the eleven faithful disciples. Twelve drummers drumming, the twelve points of the Apostles' Creed. When and where did Christmas cards originate? In England, December 1843, 
Sir Henry Cole sent the first card to John Horsley entitled Brimming Cheer. Cole wanted the card to depict that Christmas should be a time of giving, so he had a picture painted on a card of a family celebrating Christmas by giving gifts of clothing and food to the poor. Well, within two years, Christmas cards were being sent by the thousands. By 1873, Christmas cards became popular in the United States as well. It wasn't until the 18th century, the early 1900s, that card printers began to produce religious scenes of the nativity, angels, and shepherds on Christmas cards. One story that changed the way the people of a nation saw Christmas. In 1843, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol was written during the Industrial Age, which was a time when all holidays had been eliminated. Men worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, and children were put to work in factories by age eight. They had little or no education. The story of Scrooge revealed the ungodly values of the people of that day. And this story changed the way they saw Christmas and the way they saw themselves. The story represented the redemptive love of God in giving us Jesus Christ. Other traditions at Christmas have their story too. Some of the following traditions may not be as popular today, but I felt it would be good to give a brief background of these traditions. Mistletoe. Its name comes from an old English word, mistle, meaning dung or tan or twig. Implying the plant springs to life from bird droppings on tree branches and appearing to grow out of nothing, this plant was viewed with awe. In the second century, this plant became a symbol of peace and protection. And even Scandinavian warriors would stop fierce battles if they found themselves under trees where mistletoe grew. When mistletoe berries migrated to England, the plant became a sign of love. If a couple would pass under the plant and stop and kiss, then it meant God would bless them with everlasting love. Christians across Europe believe this plant showed a sign to the world of the love of God who sent his son Jesus to the world. Poinsettias originated in the Mexican culture. In 1824, Joel Poinsett, ambassador to Mexico, attended a Christmas Eve service at a small Catholic church in Mexico, and he was deeply affected by these exotic red flowers adorning the church. He was given seeds, and he planted them and began presenting these beautiful flowers to churches as gifts at Christmas, and the plant was named after him. A birthday cake for Jesus. In the 1880s, the baking of a birthday cake for baby Jesus became common in England and in America to give parents a way to explain why Jesus' birth and life are still so important. Christmas Seals. In 1907, Emily Bissett, a fundraiser for the American Red Cross in Wilmington, Delaware, raised funds for those suffering with TB. Today, more than 40 nations still use Christmas seals to help fight this disease. Boxing Day. Maybe you've never heard of that. It was in the 8th century the church established that metal boxes be placed near the church entry on December 26 to receive special mission offerings to then be distributed to the poorest of the poor. Xmas. That's an X with an M-A-S behind it. The letter X, as a part of the word Christmas, was not originally considered irreverent. It was not meant as Xing out the name of Christ. The Greek word for Christ is Christos, and it's X-R-I-S-T-O-S, pronounced Christos. When many Greek Gentiles accepted Christ, the Greeks used the letter X as their symbol of faith. When a Christian Gentile was martyred, other Christian traced an X to mark the spot where a true believer gave his or her life for Christ. Today, few know the Greek and the need for the X is no longer needed as a symbol. How did Santa Claus become affiliated with Christmas? St. Nicholas and Christmas. Less than 300 years after the birth of Christ, a baby was born in Lycia, Turkey, by the name of Nicholas. 
He was the son of wealthy, godly parents. Orphaned as a young teenager, Nicholas was left quite well-to-do. But he decided to take his family's money and distribute it to the needy in his hometown. He did not want people to know he was giving these gifts, so he would secretly leave packages on people's doorsteps or put the gifts or money through open windows at night. Soon people everywhere were talking about this secret saint. After quite some time, he was discovered. His story is fascinating. History tells us because of his great love for Christ, he became a monk when he was only 17 years old, then a priest at age 19, and an archbishop in his early 20s. His dynamic ministry often caused him to be thrown in jail. He was known as a powerful prayer warrior with the ability to heal the sick, a signs and wonders pastor. Yet after his death, it was his giving spirit that continued on in the hearts of the people he touched. He was declared Saint Nicholas, and at one time, in honor of his memory, it was a custom in Europe to give gifts on December 6 called Saint Nicholas Day. His fame spread across Europe, England, and eventually to America. In Holland, he was known as Sinterklaas, a helper of the Christ child. In England, Father Christmas, a tall, thin, elderly man with a long beard and a large sack filled with toys. In France, Pierre Noel, a man who brought special cakes and candies. How did St. Nicholas get the name Santa Claus? Why the name change? When Europeans immigrated to America, they told the story of St. Nicholas. But their heavy accent caused his name to sound like Santa Claus. Then in 1773, some U.S. newspapers named him St. A. Claus instead of St. Nicholas. That name quickly became Santa Claus, and it stuck. He was known as a man who was kind, gentle, and jolly. Santa's final makeover came in 1931 when Coca-Cola featured a portly, grandfatherly Santa with rosy cheeks in their advertisements. How was it established that Santa comes on Christmas Eve? The tradition of Santa coming on Christmas Eve was established in 1822 when Pastor Clement Moore wrote a poem for children entitled, A Visit from St. Nicholas. It is now known as The Night Before Christmas. This pastor was the one who established the tradition of Santa arriving, not on St. Nicholas Day of December 6th or on January 6th of Epiphany, but on December 24th, Christmas Eve. This seemingly magical St. Nicholas now arrived in a sled, led by flying reindeer and coming down chimneys with presents in a sack on his back. When the pastor read his poem to his congregation on Christmas Eve, it changed the way Americans celebrated Christmas from then on, and a new image of Santa emerged. In America, Santa became a man who is kind, gentle, and of course, jolly. It's interesting to me that a pastor wrote this poem. You may ask, is it okay for our children to believe in Santa Claus? There is so much talk about Santa during the holidays, I think children at a very young age will believe in Santa. But they grow up quickly, and that belief fades very quickly. With Santas everywhere, it doesn't take long for children to realize there is more to this story of Santa. To help with children's understanding, I'm convinced that along with Santa Claus, it is good to tell our children the story of St. Nicholas, the original Santa. I've shared with my children and grandchildren, and it did not negatively impact their feelings about Santa. There are a few good Christian books about St. Nicholas, the original Santa, you can order to read to your children. This does not mean that we do not share the true meaning of Christmas. May I encourage all of us to keep the Christ of Christmas alive in our hearts and in the hearts of our children and our grandchildren, for Jesus is the reason for the season. If you ask my four younger grandchildren about the meaning of Christmas, they will tell you Jesus. And at ages 3 to 10, they still believe there is a Santa. Society has made Santa's story a fable. It was Nicholas' love for Jesus Christ that is the true story of Santa Claus. St. Nicholas, the giving, signs and wonders pastor. 
The Santas we see today can be a reminder to us and to our children of the original Santa. Chapter 4 How do we keep Christ in Christmas? Is there really a way God can use our Christmas traditions as a witness to those around us of the true meaning of Christmas? Let me ask you a few questions. Should Christians just quietly acknowledge Christ's birth within their churches or homes? Or should Christians stop even acknowledging Christmas as some feel scripture might not be specific as to how to celebrate, or it could be offensive, or others feel our decorations may be of pagan origin? In reality, will it even make a difference in the world if we as Christians do not put up decorations or lights or participate in any other traditions as a way to celebrate Christmas? Let's take another look at history. The first thing anti-Christian nations did to try to end Christianity was to stop all traditional celebrations of Christmas. No lights, no trees, no decorations, or even mention of Christmas. Interesting, isn't it? Can you see how it did make a difference when Christians were either forced to or simply quit acknowledging Christ's birth by ending the traditions of Christmas? What happened? The lights went out. Oppression set in. But when those anti-Christian nations fell, the lights again shone brightly and the trees went back up at Christmas. My prayer is that the light of Christmas will shine brighter than ever in our hearts, in our nation, and in the world. Yes, there is a negative spiritual influence that resists Christmas. The enemy of God, and he is our enemy, is at work to hinder Christians from enjoying Christmas in order to diminish the reason for the season. May you rejoice and rest in the presence of Christ during this season and resist any feelings of oppression, stress, or strife that you or your family may sense. I encourage you to go to church as a family, celebrate with other believers, sing carols, read the Christmas story with fresh eyes, be joyful. You know the reason for the season. This is a time to remind ourselves of God's love for us in giving us his son. Let's be practical, too. Yes, it can be a stressful time for various reasons. It's usually difficult because of trying to do too much or spend too much. Do not go in debt. I'm not promoting going overboard with decorations or gift giving. Simple can be beautiful. The decorations we have put up in our home come from years of collecting various Christmas items and ornaments. Establish traditions that fit your family. As a part of our Christmas tradition, our family always goes to a Christmas Eve service at church. It is such a beautiful time of singing carols and hearing the Christmas story afresh. And then we gather in our home for a fun family time. If you do not go to a Christmas Eve service, I recommend that you do. And if all possible, go as a family. Whatever you do, whether, whatever symbols you display or traditions you may keep or do not keep, allow this season to be a time when you and your family reminisce about the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and of God's love for you and the world. I believe as we honor Christ's coming in big or small ways, we are a witness of God's love to those around us. This is a special time to reach out to others, to greet one another with a smile and with a Merry Christmas. I encourage you to begin reading the Christmas story December 1st and read small portions each day until Christmas. Meditate on what you read and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the impact of God's wonderful love. It would be a good thing to make this a family tradition. As you look at the Christmas decorations again, remember this. The tree represents life, the tree of life. Today's Christmas tree is the result of revival. And Jesus died on a tree to give us life. Decorations on the tree, a reminder of God's blessings and harvest. Gifts beneath the tree represent our most precious gift from Father God, 
Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to give gifts to men. Candles and lights represents Jesus, the light of the world, is welcome in our home. And the light shining around our homes is a witness to others of the light. Carols, a time to celebrate Christ's birth in praise and worship. And Santa Claus, remember the praying, signs and wonders, gift-giving pastor, the secret saint who loved Jesus with all his heart. So I say to you, Merry Christmas. Have a merry, joyous celebration of the coming of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. For Jesus is still the reason for the season.